Prologue Being followed is a strange feeling. Knowing you're being followed is even stranger. Who's to say that you could do anything to stop it? Feeling eyes on your all the time, having to act oblivious, to keep moving along on borrowed time. The impending doom lingers over your head, making the hairs on the back of your neck rise and fall. As the clock ticks the sound bounces inside of the skull, then the clock strikes twelve. And it's all over. Chapter 1 1. Missing October 13, 1983. She remembers. She always remembers. 2. The ride to the police station was a long one, even though her thighs burned and her hands gripped the handles it felt slow. She knew realistically that the ride was less than five minutes. A twig hung from her hair, dangling and tickling the shell of her ear. The street lights were on, they flickered in some areas, and in others, they had long gone yellow. The bike jumped in some areas as the tires jumped over the rocks embedded in the dirt road. Turning into the station driveway, she three, he biked down, thankfully not falling and managing to catch her footing. The bike wasn't so lucky, it tumbled to the cold concrete with a rattling thud and she didn't bother to turn around and fix it. In the cold of the October night her hands were dry, the new cuts not even registering. Her heartbeat shook through her body, throbbing in the base of her skull and in the palms of her hands it was unnaturally fast, but she did nothing to slow it. The thread of her sweater left tingling in their wake as it glided over the sensitive skin of her tender palm. Her nails were clenched in her hands, sure to draw blood from how tight they were. The police station was lively, like always, and coffee distinctly lingered in the air around it, making her breaths a little more pleasant. Nothing else is open, of course it would be at this time of night. It was well past 12 p.m., most people were sleeping now, it's a school night, after all. Priya started walking to the doors of the station, her feet tired and sore. If not for the adrenals, she would drop dead right here and now. What should I tell them? I'm sure nobody would believe me. I'd get sent to the nut house, like Uncle Sam, that's for sure. The gravel crunched under her shoes, the sound revere bed in her brain. She took a second to ponder what she should do, hand already gripping the cold handle of the station door. She can turn around right now and just go home like it's any other night, that would be the easy way out. But she was never one to do things the easy way. She gripped the handle and pulled with the might that she could muster. It felt like the worker stopped, the air went still and stale. Finally an officer walked up to her. There's a curfew, if there isn't an emergency, then go home. The lady's tone was dull and bored, as if she couldn't be bothered with anything this late at night. My friend disappeared. Disappeared? That was the first thing she could think of? Not went missing, or has been misplaced, but disappeared. That was a child's word, people don't just disappear, no. They go missing, they get killed, they get lost. But people don't disappear. But she was foolish, she spoke first thing that came to mind, that caused the lady to stop popping the minty gum and look at Priya. Her eyes glanced over her slowly, trailing from head to toe, and then, to the clock, mounted on the wall, not taking a second to blink between. Priya can't say that she knows what she looks like now, it wasn't like she could stop at a mirror on the way. Name. The lady spoke the word as if she were demanding, instead of asking. Priya was too disheveled to focus on her tone, it passed right by her. Donna Harrison. The officer's blue eyes lowered down to the yellow legal tablet and she picked up the first pen she saw. Date of birth. Priya's brain scrambled for an answer throughout all of the chaos that was mixing around in there. Numbers, numbers, she needed numbers. Not only numbers, but numbers that made sense, she needed the right numbers. A date came to mind, January 14, 1970. The woman popped the gum, the smell whipped back into Priya's face, making her nose burn. And this isn't some prank? Kids these days seem to like those. Priya was at a loss for words, all she could do was shake her head when none of the words would force their way through the vocal barrier. Meet with Officer Hathaway and tell him the details. She ripped off the piece of paper and handed it to Priya. She fumble reached out for it and the thin paper felt rough in her hands. Turning around she was met with the scene of a busy station, it wasn't her first time being here, but the chaos never ceased to amaze her each time. It was a wonder how everyone kept up with everything all the time. It was a mystery how anything got done in here, but the crime rate was low so they had to be doing something right. Her eyes grazed the room, who was Officer Hathaway. After seeing how lost she was the lady pointed him out and that's when she noticed how easy it should have been to spot him. Green eyes and a head of vibrant red hair. She rehearsed her story once more in her head, before the words dared to leave her mouth. It was a bad cover story, but it's better than the real one. 
and as she kept repeating it the fear started to leave her body because no matter how much she said it, they seemed to see right through the lie. That's what they get paid for anyway, but she prayed to whatever god was out there that just this one time they made a mistake. When they determined that she wasn't telling the truth, they put her in a room alone of police holding, they cuffed her to the table so she wouldn't get out and run, and she knows that if she could have she would have. Biked away to leave all of this behind, but that wasn't an option anymore. But the real announce was coming from the the fact that. 3. They keep saying that she couldn't have disappeared into thin air. A 13-year-old Priya sat until he interrogation room, she looked at the gray empty walls, and they stared back equally uninterested. Her foot was tapping, and the sound was repetitive enough that it calms her nerves just the smallest amount and the metal handcuffs were already digging into her already sore wrist. When she would pull or tug too hard it would sting a little, which would bring her back to reality when her mind would go a little foggy. How she wished it were a dream that she could wake up from instead of having to suffer this nightmare. She ended up in the room after one too many times of telling the same story. It was clear they didn't believe it. When she saw her reflection, she almost jumped back. There was dirt on her skin and clothes, twigs and small sticks in her hair and small cuts along her skin that were already healing but still stung. Under her eyes was Puffy from crying and trying to wipe said tears a little too hard. The cuffs of her sweater were damp with the salty tears, getting colder as it dried. She knew they could see her though what looked like a mirror, she learned that from her father who had been a cop before his retirement. She also knew they were letting her sit alone for the guilt to build, and it would be if not for the fact that she was still trying to process it all herself. She lost track of time, it had to have been at least three hours since she's been in custody. She stuck to her answers, no sir, no ma'am, I don't know what happened. They would glare at her, trying to intimidate, but she would put on a mask of being unaffected, which only proved to make them angrier, feeling like she's wasting their time and it's true that she is. But still, they would ask again and her answer would be the same. They didn't seem to understand that her answer wouldn't change. The officers finally seemed to give up, convinced that it was a joke of some sort, which is how she got where she is now, slouching back in her seat and counting the seconds in her head. She sat up when she heard the heavy door open and a man sat in front of her. He took a deep breath and slapped a thick closed folder on the silver table. You're making this more difficult than it needs to be, kid. The man was twice her size. Office butcher is what the label read and it was quite accurate in its description. Not only was the man tall, but also heavyweight. His stomach hung over his belt a little, in a way she had only seen on the Saturday cartoons. He had a mustache, the kind that she would see on every ad that she came across, according to her father it was very popular in the 40 and made a comeback in the 70s. But it did nothing to make his face any less plump. His mustache was brown with hints of red in it when the lamp O above hit it just right. His eyes were narrow but would widen at times of surprise, or was like seeing Sam's sheepdog lift his hair. When her silence answered him once again, he leaned back in his chair. Would you like some water? She looked up from the crumbs on his mustache, which showed the remains of a very crummy lunch, to his eyes. He appeared to be relaxed, but she sensed there was something under the calm expression. But her throat was patched, it felt like swallowing a mouth full of cotton. Like the time she was five years old and they went to the beach in Mississippi, she had gotten a handful of the sand and put it in her mouth. She coughed and it felt like her lungs were trying to escape her body. She reminisced on the feeling of the water going down her throat in big greedy gulps when her mother had gotten to her, the cold water cooling her overheated body. She didn't have that now, even though she managed to catch her breath her throat was still dry. She took a shaker breath and could feel the cold air fling down her throat like the walls of it were scraping together. Putting ice on your tongue on a cold day and having to rip it off. Goosebumps raised on her skin and brushed the inner walls of her sweater. She looked at the officer and he looked back at her expectantly, she was wondering if it was really a question or not. She didn't think that he was really asking, but that never stopped her from answering before. No, thank you. He sighed. He leaned forward, his hands in front of him, fingers intertwined as he took a deep breath. Look, kid. It's late, we all want to leave. He glanced up from his hands to see if she was following along, it felt patronizing but we can't do that unless you give us your statement. Your real statement, no more of these jokes and fairy tales. Understand? She hated when adults asked that. Understand? As if she were too young or dumb to know what a few simple words mean. She leaned forward in her own seat, the handcuffs restricted her from going too far, he leaned forward, thinking that he he's trapped her into telling on herself when she knew he wouldn't believe what she would say. I dot don't, no. She broke it up, spoke slowly to make sure that he caught every word. Understand? 
She repeated his earlier words and almost smiled at the way his face went red. He let out a high sigh and leaned back in his seat, his fingers went to the brine of his nose, massaging it from the incoming headache. I don't know why they thought I'd be the person for this job. He was too tired to mutter it, that much showed in the form of dark circles under his eyes. Priya ignored him. He was quiet for a second before he started speaking again, his voice coming out more tired than last time. So let me get this straight. Your statement, or recounting of the events is that you were talking with your friend, and from the looks of it way past curfew. You turned around for a second and when you didn't hear her anymore. She was gone, no trace. His face was blank and unimpressed, his tired eyes struggled to stay open as he repeated the accounts to her. Yes, that's what I've been saying. He held his hand up to signal her to stop talking, and his other hand stayed on its place at his Joe's bridge, where it kept massaging. You didn't hear anyone approving, and there was nobody suspicious when you got there, she made no sound when she disappeared, she was just there and then she wasn't. In plain sight, or close to it, but nobody else managed to see it. But what they did manage to see was you yelling in front of a close video store at 12 a.m., and file a hell of a stack of noise complaints. Well, when someone said it like that she could hear how ridiculous the story sounded but she needed to stick to it. Do you need that in written form? The man held his hand up again and her jaw clicked shut. Don't get smart. He sighed again and Priya was starting to wonder if he had some kind of breathing problem. He was a large man, but he looked quite healthy. Kid, do you know how that sounds? Of course she knew how it sounded, fake, crazy, insane even. She knew it didn't make sense, but somehow it was easier to convince her loser that this was real rather than the actual reality. It's always better to live in a dream. I know what it sounds like, but it's the truth, she had to force the last word out. Lying through her teeth. The man searched her face, trying to catch a hint of a like she would think, but he gave up quickly. And you're sure it wasn't a dream? Or that you imagined it? Her eyes hardened into what felt like it should be a glare. What are you trying to say? I'm not trying to say anything. I'm saying, it's late, and a lot is going on. The state is telling us that all these people are going missing and that can cause us to have not-so-real thoughts or visions. She didn't know if she should be offended or not, sure it didn't sound like he was saying something bad, but she had long learned that people don't always say what they mean. He took another heavy breath. She wondered if went lightheaded from absorbing all the air in the room. I get folders and folders of missing people on my desk a week, so we have to make sure that this is real and I don't gather a team to go out looking for a person that's not missing or a person that doesn't exist at all. She is real. Her own outburst scared her, like her very soul jumped out of her body without her permission. They both looked a little taken aback. She is real. She repeated in a quieter voice, but despite that the words still bounced on the walls of the almost empty room. The words sounded rash even to her own ears. Officer Butcher glanced at her for a second longer, the outburst could be one reason, but from what she's seen in the mirror, there could be others. Tell me this, why did you come here instead of going to her mother? Priya considered it for a second, why did she come here? They obviously weren't doing anything and she's wasted everyone's time being here. It would have been way easier to try looking for Donna on her own. It wouldn't be much, but it would at least be better than doing nothing. Or she could be home with her own parents, coddling over her, like they tend to do, and pretend that this was all a dream. That she would go to school with Donna in the morning and she would tell her about this bizarre dream that she had and they would laugh the whole time they ate lunch. Office Butcher noticed her silence but did nothing to break it, he let her think and thinking she did. What would be the most plausible excuse that she could use without sounding too crazy? There was a quick though that flew through her mind and she struggled to mentally grab onto it. I don't know. I was scared. That was the best she could come up with. Fear drives a lot of things, so it would be understandable for a child right? She sat back in the cold metal chair, the chill of it going thorough her sweater and sending shivers down her spine. He nodded at her answer, and why was that? Her fingers pulled say the bottom of her sweater cuffs, the loose strings had been there for a while, she knew that the sweater would rip in two if she kept pulling, but she couldn't help it. She was a coward. The lady had lost her husband not too many years ago, Priya never knew the reason that he walked out, but that sounded like a sore subject that she didn't want to touch upon. The woman was already going through too much, she can't put her through more. She can't look her in the eye and tell her that she let something happen to Donna. That she was right there and that she could have stopped it if she tried. That she could have saved the only person that the lady had left. And even though she knew that it didn't have to fall on her she can't help but feel that Donna is her responsibility. Was. Donna was her responsibility. 
but she couldn't say that. Well, her mom would be mad, and of course that would be reasonable Brit I don't know if I could even look her in the eye and tell her that, the rest of the sentence was left unsaid, she didn't know what she would say. That her daughter disappeared? Died? Got kidnapped? Which one would sound the most believable? She would need to pick a good one, but then again, there is no good way to tell someone that their child is missing in a place where missing people are forgotten. She would have to bring some folders and ease it on her, that is if she was ever let out of the station. What would she say? Hello Mrs. Harrison. Oh, Donna? Well you see it's a really funny story, I turned around for a second and then pop, she's all gone. Yeah, she wasn't aware to be found. And the best part, nobody other than me saw or heard anything so when I went into the police station I was running on little to no evidence. Go on, have a laugh, it's funny isn't it? That sounded good, great even. All would be forgiven and they would eat dinner in the dark hours of the night and she would watch Mrs. Harrison put the flowers in the vase after taking a few delicate sniffs and fill it with the clear water from the sink. They would fall asleep on the brown sofa that sat against the yellowed walls from years of smoking inside with the windows closed watching the facts of life like it were any other day. The sunlight would crack through the blinds and the smell of bacon and eggs would float around the house. She would wake up to a home-cooked meal and she would go back gone with a smile on her face she fought the urge to laugh out loud, what was she thinking? That would end terribly. Officer Butcher looked at her, clear questioning expression with an eyebrow raised. The hefty man took another big gulp of air and then cleared his throat, which brought her back to the moment. I'll file the report, you're free to go. He took the key out of his pocket and put it in the small keyhole of the handcuffs. He paused, but we find anything that says this is a joke or a big waste of time, then you'll be back here. You won't get off so easy next time. She didn't care that he didn't believe her, if the positions were swapped, she wouldn't believe herself either. But she knew what she saw and as crazy and unbelievable that it was it happened. She can't wipe it from her brain no matter how hard she tried. Walking out of the station her hand absent-mindedly rubbed on her wrist, she struggled to see the bright angry marks on her dark skin in the darkness of the moonlight. She hated the way her sweater cuff slid across the irritated area. She picked up her bike from where it lay coldly on the sidewalk, the metal feeling like blocks of ice. The coldness of the October air was already settling in, and usually she would be rushing for a blanket or another jacket, but now she found comfort in it, the cold made her feel alive, not crazy. Her eyes went glassy as she tried to recall the meteorites from a few moments earlier. 4. They were sneaking around, they knew they shouldn't, but it was the only way they could get away from their overbearing parents. Or at least that's what it felt like. The disappearances were frequent but less during the colder days in account that everyone was inside, which made it perfect to sneak out. Priya's parents decided that 9.30 would be the perfect time for curfew and she would complain if not for the fact that it used to be 7 o'clock, not too much earlier that year. It was like any other night, she ate dinner, took a shower and brushed her teeth before kissing her parents goodnight and going to her room. She had turned off all the lights, and then she sat awake in her bed, he kind racing too much to sleep, thirty minutes passed, before she was sure that her parents were sleeping. Her sense were hyper-aware, because of how quiet the house was. Her mother had finished cleaning and putting the food away, and her father retired his project with fixing the car for the night. She heard them click off their light a few minutes ago. She listens to the stale silence for a second longer before she decided that it was safe to slip out of bed, she changed out of her bed clothes and waited for that special knock on her window. When she opened it she could see Donna Harrison looking back up at her with the dorky smile that she always wore. She had a handful of rocks that she quickly dropped in favor of waving to Priya. The little thumps on the concrete was a satisfying sound to hear. The girl waved back, hands falling into their family positions, like she had done so many times before. She reached out to the tree branch that was in front of her window, it was her only way in and out of her room without waking her parents. She slid down effortlessly, it hadn't been raining, which was rare, so her grip on the wood was strong. Donna was giggly like always, and Priya kept trying to shush her so she wouldn't wake her parents, but she ended up laughing as well. She mounted her bike that was laying uselessly against the side of her house under her bedroom window, and she could see Donna pick her bike up from where it was leaning against the strong bark of the tree. With that they rode off into the night, ten o'clock sharp. They were singing and laughing and it all felt like a distant memory even in the moment. Maybe it was the happiness of moment that put fog in front of her eyes and behind her brain. But she just couldn't shake a feeling of wrongness. Being the person she is, she don't want to ruin the fun, so she didn't say anything. Everyone had their days, who was she to judge? And Donna looked so happy. As they rode down the street they would lift their hands and let the wheels take a mind of their own. 
though Donna's eyes were tired her smile was wide. Their legs were getting a little tired and they wanted to find somewhere to chill out for a bit before they went back home. They only wanted to be gone long enough that their parents didn't notice. Maybe they would even get a small snack on the way back from the corner store with the allowance money that they carried with them. They locked their bike up in front of the closed video store. Some teenagers worked there because the manager felt like they would know more about movies and appeal to the younger audience. They quickly locked the door and one got into a car while the other started to walk, Priya hoped he was going home. Or at least he makes it there. Donna and Priya leaned against the tan-colored bricks of the building. Donna's hair was different, instead of having her hair straightened like her mother tended to do, it was puffed out into a loose afro. The curls hung on her shoulders and the different browns bounced off of the moonlight giving them a bluish hue. Her skin was lighter than usual, almost pale as if she were sick. It could be from the oncoming winter as well. Her freckles were faded and hard to see from far but still present. Her smile was wide like she had seen something amazing. The cigarette between her fingers sizzled and then she found Donna facing her. What? Something on my face? Something is wrong tonight, I don't know why, but I can feel it. Priya looked away, realizing that she was staring. Nothing, it's just cold tonight. She made the show of doing a fake full body shiver, hoping that it would make sense. Donna looked down at the sweater wrapped around her body and then up at her face. I swear you blood is literally ice water. A cloud poured out of her mouth, almost hypnotizing. She offered her cigarette and Priya pushed it away. You know I hate that stuff. Donna leaned over her in an awkward half-hug. Come on, just try it. It'll warm you up. Promise. Now she was giggling now, while trying to push her away, but without much strength behind it. Everyone else does. Give me one good reason why you don't like it. Priya, though that the answer was obvious. Firstly, I know you've seen those PSAs at school. Second, because everyone else does it. Don't you understand my contact need to be different? She dramatically put a hand over her forehead like she had seen in her mom's cheesy shows that she would forever tease her for watching and that she and Donna would make fun of every chance they got. Just try it. Priya looked at her with raised eyebrows. I don't even know how. Donna slid the small stick into her hand. You just breathe it in. Priya hesitantly took a breath and tried not to think about how her lips were on the same part that Donna's was on, people shared cigarettes all the time, it wasn't a big deal. When she realized that she wasn't getting anywhere with that the little inhales weren't getting her anywhere she took a hefty breath and almost dropped the cigarette, she let out a fit of violent coughs, pounding on her chest while small puffs of smoke came out and her eyes watered. Donna about had a fit, sliding down from the brick wall and to the concrete, holding her stomach laughing, tears prickling at the corners of her eyes. And while Donna's laughter was always delightful to hear, feeling the burning of her lungs was not. Priya tried to talk, but every time she did she was met with another coughing fit. Why they finally subsided Donna had taken the cigarette back between her fingers and took another small inhale. In her fit Priya managed to sit down on the concrete next to Donna, the coldness prickled at her exposed skin. How the hell the hell can you do that? I think I just saw the light. She wiped spit off of the costner of her moth that managed to escape through the fit. Practice, will in most cases. I just happen to be a pro. She took another puff before standing up and dropping it to stomp it out. Wrong. Something is wrong. She ignored the warning bells in her mind. The tenseness in Donna's body, despite her trying to force herself to relax. This isn't the first time that she's seen her like this. It looked like she was trying to convince herself of something. Priya has seen that look on her face one too many times before. That convincing face morphed into a thinking on. Priya pulled herself to her feet and she knew that Donna had an idea when the idea lit up in her eyes. She followed her eye line to the dark video store and then back to her face that had mischief written all over it. No, no don't look at me like that. I don't like that look. Donna's smirk never wavered. What look? Am I giving you a look? Priya narrows her eyes. You are most definitely giving me a look. Donna once again feigned innocence, but Priya could clearly see though the act. You have that I have a bad idea face. We are not getting caught again. Donna rolled her yes. Relax. We're not gonna. Funny how you said the same thing last time and we ended up in detention for five hours. Donna waved her hand. Let it go, it's in the past. Priya took her turn to roll her eyes. It was yesterday dawns. Donna ignored her and kept calculating the plan in her mind. Priya knew she was going to say something, Donna's eyes met her own. Wanna break in? There it was. Break in? 
Don's I snuck out, I think that's the most that I'm going to do tonight. Donna's hand was already on her wrist. Pre, it's fine. Nobody's going to notice, it's just a video store. And there's barely anyone around. Besides, who's going to catch us? Priya considered it for a second. No, but we could go to jail, or worse, they'll tell our parents. I'd be grounded for life, never to see my Atari again. Donna listened to her drown on and checked her wrist on which no watch resides. Are you done yet? She asked boredly while tapping her foot. Yeah, I'm done. Donna's hands was warm around Priya's wrist and the weight of it just right. She could feel herself being led to the front of the store and she put up no resistance. She followed behind Donna like second nature. They got to the glass doors and Donna tried it. Locked. Priya looked at her. Donna we literally watched them lock the doors, I don't think they magically unlock when workers are out of range. Donna's face was blank, she didn't find it funny. Hardy har har, you should do stand-up comedy pre, I'm sure they would enjoy it. Her words didn't hold as much of a joking tone as usual, grip a little tight around her wrist and her eyes darted around, checking for witnesses. Or at least that's what Priya assumed. She pretended not to notice. Bad days happen. Donna pulled out a paper clip from the small pocket in the front of her jeans and Priya didn't ask where she got it from. She tended to collect things, it was a small hobby. And to question where she got it from would be inviting yourself for a rant of a lifetime. She bent it around a bit until the bottom was straight and twisted it into the keyhole until they both heard the click of the door unlocking. Donna looked up at her with a pleased expression that held a bit of tightness while leaning down with an arm out in the most dramatic way, it was like a stage bow. You first my lady. Priya tried to hold in her laugh. Priya walked past her muttering a small, dork. Before she could hear her footsteps following being her on the soft carpeted floor. Donna reached for the light switch and Priya caught her wrist. What? She blinked stupidly and Priya looked back at her with a blank expression. Closed store, which is breaking and entering, kids in here after hours, which might I add just broke in at almost midnight. Snuck out of the house when there's a heavy curfew and smoking stolen cigarettes. She was starting to run out of fingers to count on. Need I go on? Donna cracked a small smile. No, I think I got it. Priya released her wrist, trying to ignore how tense the muscles were under the flesh and how her heart was pounding, despite them just standing there. Maybe it was the adrenaline from breaking in, doing something that you're not supposed to. Get out, something is wrong. Her mind screamed at her, red exclamation marks and a blaring alarm, but she ignores it again. Donna is happy, Donna deserves to be happy. They walked around the store, even though they'd seen it so many times, before it looked different in the dark with the only light being the moon shining through the tinted windows. The smile on Donna's face could only be described as a kid in a candy store. 5. Priya was slammed back into her body when she felt gravel under the wheels of her bike, she wasn't paying attention to where she was going. Her hands gripped tighter on the handles so she wouldn't fall off again. This part of town wasn't one that she was all too familiar with, all of the houses looked old, some of them had wooden boards covering the windows along with missing glass that ended up on the sidewalk. Some houses looked like they were still being lived in, newer cars parked on the street and in front of garages. None of the lights were on, but it was midnight so she didn't think anything of it. Sure, it's creepy and feels like it should be in a horror movie, but she's learned not to always judge a book by its cover. Maybe it was one of those places that looked better when the sun was up. Quiet howls of the trespassed her ears and the leaves skidded along the concrete and nails on a chalkboard would have been a better sound. Everything felt louder in the emptiness of the narrow street. As she rode, he hands and feet tingled, like when blood flow is cut off for a minute too long. There stood a man in the street and Priya was ready to turn the other way. She doesn't know how she got to this pair of town, but she knows when it's time to leave. He was waving slowly and she squinted to see through the sudden fog. It's hard to tell if something is wrong with her eyes or if there really was fog. She heard a trill sound, metal scraping concrete. Something glinted through the fog, the air swooshed by her ear and the fog was quite literally cut. Her head turned at neck-breaking speed to try to catch a glimpse of what was so close to her and why she could feel breathing down her neck when there was the sound of a trash bin falling. She stole a quick glance back, not wanting to look at one spot for too long to see that it did indeed fall. She almost lost balance, leaning far to the right before straightening herself. You saw something that you weren't meant to. She knows she had, but the small voice in her head wanted to make sure. The man was gone as if he had never been in the first place. 
The panic in her stomach turned back into unsettlement, which encouraged her to start pedaling faster. People always enjoyed starting Halloween early, but she had a feeling that this isn't a trick. Nothing seemed to be tonight, but how she wished it was. You're next. The voice in her head taunted her. Shut up. Her cab burned as her legs worked the pedals as she stood up to go a faster. It was something that her sister taught her when she was younger. Wait, sister? She didn't have a sister. At least not anymore. She wished it were a dream as she did so much tonight. Her mother had no memory of her firstborn. No matter how much she questioned her mother the story was always the same. But sometimes she could get her birthday mixed up, she would say 1969 instead of 1970 but she would have it on her memory. After all it was known that she tended to be airheaded at times. Priya is the only one that remembers. She distantly remembers having an older sister and then one day she didn't. Her mom told her it was a dream, that dreams could feel real, but they aren't. It was true in some cases, but this isn't one of them. All these missing people can't be a dream. It may be a little fuzzy in her memory, but it did happen. In a town where missing people are forgotten. Her earlier words echoed back to her. Forgotten. That's what always happens. She didn't know why she had to carry the burden of remembering. It's a constant weight that's heavy on her chest. Nobody should forget a person that fast, she was convinced that everyone was acting. It didn't feel real or possible, but it was. For instance, the Clyde's daughter Alma. They were her neighbors, when they moved in, they were bright-eyed and all smiles. She never understood why someone would be so happy to move to Louisiana, a retirement start, but she was happy if they were. And boy were they. They talked about wanting a new start. Been married two years and Mrs. Clyde was carrying a newborn a baby in her arms. Priya remembered playing with the girl, after all she had only been a year old when they met. They were neighborhood friends. The kind that would talk at school or in their case daycare, on the way home from the corner store and occasionally have sleepovers with. They never talked about anything deep or important, after all what would a five-year-old have to say? But they could have been described as close acquaintances. Almost as close as her best friend Castile Tuffin, who she had known since birth. Their parents had been friends since high school and ended up dating within the friend group when they got to collage. They even ended up buying houses next to each other, painted in corresponding colors, not wanting to separate when they didn't have to. So it's safe to say that they'd been neighbors since before she could talk. It was often frowned upon, a black and a white friendship? Though it wasn't terribly uncommon people still weren't used to the idea of it. They would sneer and glare at the four of them when they went out especially in the predominantly white neighborhoods where they had the best fresh fruit. She knew that Castrell noticed as much as her if not more. When they were holding hands with their mothers walking through the mall, though they were young, they weren't obvious to the world's views. But that was a different thing entirely, which really can't be opened right now. The girls were sitting outside on a warm afternoon, let it be new that Alma's parents weren't the most attentive. Her father worked on the construction site during the day and her mother was a tailor who usually worked late into the night, even though she was working from home, she tended to delve into her work and forget everything else, including her daughter. So she was outside alone with Priya and her, the memory fuzzer a little bit before it came back to focus. Her sister, her mind supplied. They were outside with her older sister. They were making mud pies, while Alma and Priya were, with the dirt and hose attached to the house that her mother used to fill the plastic pool during summer and water the plants throughout the week. It's so hot. Indeed it was, daycare and some schools had ended early because of rising temperatures. I can see if Mama had anything that could cool us off. Priya offered because they're friends and it's the polite thing to do. Or so she's learned, it was continued when she saw the small smile on her sister's face. Alma eagerly nodded her hair, wavy black hair, following along with her movements. If that's okay. Priya got up and brushed the dirt from the back of her shorts. She went into the house and almost melted with relief from a second out of the hot air. She spotted her mother sitting at the dining room table, she looked worried. Well, stressed would be a better word to describe it. She held a white envelope and was glaring at the calculator next to it. Mama, the lady jumped before looking up from the letter, clearly not hearing the door being opened, do we have any popsicles? Her mother used to hand make them for the neighborhood kids, but she didn't do it too much anymore, but there had to be a few left over. Looking back, maybe it was the white kids who told their parents. She never noticed, but maybe it was because she wasn't paying too much attention. Always stuck in her own imagination with her imaginary friends that everyone thought she had. Joan Green stood up from her seat and looked into the freezer. When she closed the door she shook her head. 
Looks like we're out. Her lips pursed into a tight line, thinking about something. Priya tried not to pout at the new information, but ready to walk out while dragging her feet to tell Alma and her sister, Hannah, that there wasn't anything. But then her mother was rummaging through her purse. She dropped a dollar bill into her small hands, and the girl looked up at her, with wide eyes. I heard Kalian is making them this time of year. You know who I'm talking about right? Right? That was a question that she liked. Someone open and ready to explain or to be wrong. A confirmation of knowledge. Nothing like the demeaning understand. Mrs. Patrickson's granddaughter. A small rewarding smile slipped onto her mother's face. Right. You girls think you can take the trip there and back? Priya nodded energetically, ready to please as always. Looking back it was hard not to to notice the dark circles under her mother's eyes. Priya held the dollar tight in her hand and raced out of the house, closing the got-wired door behind her. Her short legs carry her to where Hannah was sitting with Alma in the grass. She weighed the dollar around as if she had won a prize. She was sure that there was a smile on her face, because her cheeks, but but she couldn't stop. She handed the money to her sister and kneeled in the grass where they were sitting, hands pulling at the strands of grass in handfuls and trying not to vibrate in place out of excitement. Her sister was nine at the time, but she deemed her as adult as she did her mother and father. She put the bill up to the sun like she saw the man at the corner store do when her mother would hand the money to him. She didn't know why he did it, but it was fun to do. What's this for? She asked as he looked through the green paper, its shadow casting a green sheet of light over her skin. Mama says Kalian is selling popsicles. She asked if we wanted to get some. Hannah nodded and picked herself up out of the dirt to brush off the back of her shorts and pocketed the money. Alma also got up, mud sticking to her hands and the bottoms of her shoes. Hannah turned the hose back on and the clear water flowed out, cold and refreshing. The girls rinsed their hands, watching the light brown, almost sand-colored water spill into the grass. The distance from Priya's home and the Partixons' home was more more than around the corner and down the street. It was hot, but the walk would be worth it. Once both of the girls were cleaned up Hannah took hold of bother, their slightly damp hands that they tried to wipe off onto their shirts and led the way. They followed close behind her in short strides, trying to keep up with the other girl. Maybe even looking around to enjoy the scenery, or watch the funny lines from Heat Wave that distorted the world around them. Priya was too busy talking that she didn't realize that Alma stopped. She was rambling about how one of the teachers at daycare wouldn't let her paint when they had stations, and she had to play with something else even through she didn't want to. She wasn't allowed at the paint anymore because she kept mixing the colors and the other kids would complain about it because they could. And how some kid had peed their pants and their mother had to pick them up, the class smelled like pee until they got out and the teacher refused to open a window. Hannah was listening eagerly, she would always ask about her day, so it was second nature for her to start whenever she got the chance. She would nod along and chime in at some parts that she deemed necessary. But Alma however didn't say much, walking in near silence. It wasn't strange, considering that she had always been quiet and more reserved, even as a baby she didn't cry much. So as always they would talk until she would engage in the conversation, but she always preferred to listen instead. Her grip was unnaturally tied around Hannah's, a little white at the knuckles and very sweaty, but Hannah wrote it off as her hands still not completely dry from when they rinsed them earlier. She looked a little out of it, maybe even confused. She looked behind them several times, which in turn made Hannah paranoid and her bigger hands tightened around theirs and her legs were braces as if she were ready to run. What's wrong? She asked and the girl shook her head. Nothing, I just thought I heard somebody. Hannah didn't question it and Priya was too far into her own world to notice. She would much rather go to the corner store and her some ice cream, but it was a little further walk than her mother felt comfortable with them walking alone and it was much cheaper to get the ones that Kalian makes. She's only 11 years old and a popsicle was 25 cents from her. So people usually went in groups with a dollar bill and so that they could get enough for the whole friend group. The leaves crunched under their shoes with a crisp sound that scratched Priya's brain. Hannah had told her to stop because every time she did it Alma would jump and dart her head behind them. At the time she thought that everyone was just being a killjoy. Alma was tense, as if she were looking for someone or something. Her breaths were fast even though they were just walking and not running or doing anything to physically exert the body. Hannah would send a glance to check on her, her eyebrows furrowed with concern. By the time they got the house the sun was starting to set, casting the sky an orange light. They had left during late afternoon when they left and they may or may not have taken a little break at the park. While Priya was in the swing, going back and forth ecstatically Alma was stiff and on edge. Hannah seemed to think that it would cure the girl's paranoia, but it only got worse. 
She didn't want to say anything when Hannah asked her about it so she taken to looking for the danger herself. That was the point that Priya knew something was off. Hannah walked to the bench and stood on it with a hand shielding her eyes from the attack of the sun. Priya was sure that she was looking around to see if there really was anyone suspicious there or if Alma had listened to a bad bedtime story or perhaps one of the folk tales from the older kids. Both of the girls were still on the swing with their backs to the sun, the warmth seeping through their thick layers of clothes. Priya was barely swinging anymore. When she saw how unenthusiastic Alma was it kind of turned her off of all the fun. She was now only moving her feet a little so the toes of her shoes dug into the wooden pellets like a crab burrowing in sand. Alma was still, back ramrod straight and her swing didn't move even when the wind blew the chains didn't shake so the whole world felt unnaturally quiet. But her long wavy hair flew behind her like a beautiful brown flag. Priya kicked softly at her ankle, not wanting to hurt her but wanting to get her attention and the younger girl looked up with a sort of worried look in her eyes, now Priya would describe it as distressed. What's wrong? You've been acting weird. Alma shrugged, not wanting to give an answer or just not knowing how. Is something wrong? She shook her head and looked down at the wooden parts beneath her feet. You can't tell me? It's okay, I can keep a secret. Once again the girl shook her head. I can't tell you. Priya didn't want to argue with her. Fine. Don't tell me then. She dropped the argument easily and slid off of the blue plastic of the swing and walked to her sister. She heard the smaller girl's footsteps behind her and the sound of the swing chain shaking as she jumped off of it. They continued walking and made it to the small greenhouse. Hannah let go of their hands to knock. Once and then twice. Coming. They all heard it being shouted from the inside of the house and the shuffling of slippers. A woman with gray hair popped her head out and then smiled. What can I do for you girls? Her voice kind and patient though Priya almost didn't hear her over the feeling of the cold air that forced it way out. She knew that it was hot but her mother have never turned the air that high. It reminded her of when she went to her grandmother's house, that woman never turns the air off, even during winter. And somehow she's still hot. Is Kaylee in here? The woman shook her head, because of the sunset her hair took a orange glow and her eyes looked lighter. I can't say that she is, but maybe I could help. Hannah pulled the money from her pocket and Alma's eyes darted around again. We were just hoping to buy some popsicles. The woman's eyes lit up slightly. I actually think I know where she keeps them. Do you mind holding on for a second? Not at all. The door was left slightly ajar and Priya thanked God that she could feel the steady flow of air on her skin. While she could feel herself cooling down, she saw goosebumps on Alma's arm and the girl's hands came up to smooth them down. She met eyes with Hannah and there was a silent conversation. Right after this, they would be taking her home. She was obliviously sick in one way or another, they could check on her tomorrow, she lived across the street so it wasn't a huge trip to take in any case. Hannah paid and they all walked home, it was getting dark now and the sun was almost completely down. Alma's gray stuffed bunny was stuck in the crook of her elbow and she wasn't eating her popsicle. When she saw the other girls noticed she started taking small kitten licks to make it look like she was just eating slower than them. As always the trip home felt shorter than the trip there, they dropped Alma off and Hannah didn't walk in the front door until she was sure that Alma made it in safe. That was the last time anyone saw her. It was about two hours later that they heard a frantic knocking at the door. They all assumed that it was the policeman as at the time her father was still working there. Her mother raced up from where she was knitting calmly on the couch and watching the colored television and her hand grasped the cold doorknob. It flung open at a speed that almost hit her in the face but she didn't even flinch. But the people on the porch were not who she was expecting. Marina and Ray's Clyde stood in front of her, wide-eyed and panicked. Marina started speaking before Joan could blink, talking a mile a minute. Okay, calm down Marina. Deep breaths. She followed the instructions, and the air whistled out of her red lips. Start over, what's wrong? Her lip quivered before the words tumbled out, this time more legible. We can't find Alma anywhere and we just want to try and rule everyone out. Have you seen her? The lady's eyes were darting around the dining room and at small places that her daughter would be able to hide. No, Hannah and Priya just dropped her home about two hours ago. The woman made no sound, silent tears fell down her face. Somebody took her. Somebody took our baby, and we were right here. Her husband had a hand on her shoulder, and she leaned into it. She could have gotten lost. She's really small she can fit into a lot of places. When Priya was three, she used to sleep behind the TV. The woman's red lips pulled into a soft smile, but her eyes told a different story. I, I just don't know where she could have gone. 
I can't even find Fluffless, she takes him everywhere. Priya never knew that the stuffed bunny had a name, but that one suited it. Cute and still innocent. Calm down. I'm sure we'll be able to find her. The woman shook her head a little. We have to. I tried to call the police, but they won't file the report unless she's been missing for more than 48 hours. She nodded in understanding, not speaking until the woman got through her unintelligible jumble of words. The woman was panicked and nobody wanted to blame her for the lack of attention she gave to her child, but that was obviously part of the problem. People were coming out of their houses to see what the noise was about, it was dark outside now, the street lights were on and yet the whole community was awake looking for the four-year-old girl. But no matter how hard they searched or how hard they looked, nobody seemed to have seen the young girl. Her mother sobbed and her father tried to keep a straight face, yet there were silent tears, making trails down their tired faces. Someone didn't like all the noise and commotion of everyone searching and called the police who came out and looked around for a bit. When Mrs. Clyde tried to tell him what happened she would trip over her words. Are you sure she didn't run away? The woman was baffled, she stuttered over her words, and it ended with a full body sob. The couple didn't sleep for two days, looking under her bed, in the woods behind their house, and in Mrs. Patrickson's house with her being the last one that seen the girls before they made their way back home. When the police finally got on the case, there was missing posters everywhere in town with the little girl's face plastered on it. Her birthday, her weight, her height, all things her parents provided for them and yet no one had any luck. And then the strangest thing happened, everyone slowly started forgetting her as if she never existed in the first place. It started with her own parent. They were at the opening of the woods along with Hannah and Priya who were throwing big branches to get down the path. They paused for a second and Priya turned behind them to see that they were just standing there, looking a bit lost. Who are we looking for again? Her mother asked, and Priya looked up at her age almost shocked that the words came out. Your daughter Alma. The young girl spoke with a confused tone. It was weird of them to forget, but she didn't think much of it as she continued to look, calling the little girl and checking in small spaces that the others couldn't reach in. The search came to an end after another full day of searching for her this being the third day that the community didn't sleep. The second stranger thing is that the missing posters were starting to fade. The most logical explanation would be that they had been in the sun for a while and that's what usually happens. But it looked like someone was taking the posters because as the days went on it looked like there was less and less poster stuck to the light pole. She had seen an old man taking one inside to rip up for paper sculptures and then there was another who just picked them up and threw them away talking about kids littering in the streets and how they would be the last hope of the generations. The fourth day of searching approached quickly, Priya was down in the dumps where the discarded fridges and old cars were thrown. She would throw open the fridge doors to see if the little girl somehow managed to get herself stuck inside of one and when she saw nobody inside of it, she would move on to the next. She was with some of the other neighborhood kids who were looking under the cars and inside of them if the odors weren't too rusted to open, and some of them would even lift the rusted trucks. A little girl about a year or so younger than her stopped with her hand still on the truck on the car. What are we doing here, the grown-ups always tell us to stay away from these things. We can get really hurt. Priya closed the door of the fridge that she was looking in and her eyebrows raised at the other girl. She was a little annoyed that as she's been having to repeat herself and everyone keeps asking, but she will keep answering until they understand. We're looking for Alma. The other girl scratched her head, who is Alma? Priya didn't even look shocked anymore. She still glanced around the thick trees to see if it was all some huge community prank that she wasn't in on. But when she saw nobody emerge from the bushes, she looked back at the other's girl. She's the Clyde's daughter. The girl stared at her for what felt like a significantly long time. The Clyde's kid? They don't have any kids. She spoke with a matter of a fact tone like she knew that as she was right. And then she had that dumb false understanding look that all the others had been giving her. Oh, I see. You have an imaginary friend. Priya's lip rose in confusion, imaginary friend? She tried to understand why the girl had put emphasis on the word imaginary. The girl could see her confusion and started to speak again. It's okay, you don't have to be embarrassed. We've all had imaginary friends at your age. Priya didn't point out the fact that the girl was barely older than her. The rest of the kids left the dump soon after, going inside to get something to eat or just enjoy the blessing that is air conditioning. She was left to look through the heaps of junk alone. On the fifth day of looking, her name was almost like that of a ghost. Nobody would say her name anymore, and if one did in passing, they seemed to forget about who they were talking about only seconds earlier. She went to the Clyde's house after an hour of searching to see if they found anything that could lead to what happened to her, and she wondered why she was still shocked by their response. 
Oh sweetie we don't have any children. They both nodded with strained expressions, both unnaturally wide smiles and eyes that told a different story. She wanted to say something, anything. She wanted to say, Alma. Your daughter, Alma. But she didn't, she knew that Alma was already forgotten. She didn't understand how or why it happened, but that was the first memory that she had of it. For weeks after she kept looking for the girl. After daycare, in the woods behind their house, in the high grass of the uncut lawn Mr. Jason never bothered with, but she never found anything. The missing posters that were left were covered with other posters of missing people or events like Battle of the Bands. Some of them were ripped and torn to the ground and others were used as fuel for fireplaces. Others had no picture of her face at all, and her name was nothing but a shadow of what it used to be. The police stopped looking for her, it was a waste of time because she didn't exist. There were no records of her anywhere, no birth certificate, no pictures nothing to show that she was ever a person to begin with. And through the state was telling them that they had too many cases of missing people. They never noticed that anybody was missing. Because these people didn't exist. They would ask parents, they would ask teacher, and they would ask neighbors yet none of them had any recollection of these people. When Priya would speak up, she would always be praised for her imagination. It was always in a sweet, almost demeaning tone, as if she were making it all up. She convinced herself that it was a dream. That was the easiest way that she could make sense of it. All of these missing people and nobody to look for them? It couldn't be real. She let go of it, everything had to all be in her head. Her older sister would look at her with concern in her eyes, asking if she was okay when she would look up into space for a little too long or start talking about a friend that she used to hang out with that disappeared. She soon leaned to stop talking about it, it was better for everyone that way. So when asked who Alma was she had no response. Alma Clyde, the girl that didn't exist. 6. The memories came back as if they just happened yesterday. The little girl with the green eyes and tan skin, her wavy brown hair that flowed down her shoulders like a warm blanket, and the small beauty mark that rested under her lip. There was the image that was left of her, the picture that came into her mind when she thought of the name Alma. The other picture is a small girl dead in a ditch, her eyes wide and unfocused, the black taking over the green and the green fading into a foggy blue instead. Her skin pale and lifeless, drained of blood and energy. Her small mouth hung open as the sewer water flooded into the small cave, bugs, and small animals, making a home there to stray away from the cold of winter. That yellow sundress that she wore torn up and falling off in some places as they had no support to hold on to. Cuts on her baby soft skin that never go the chance to heal and her chest never rising and falling again. And then she would image the void of her irises traveling to her, finding her in the dark. Her lifeless unhinged jaw would black as her dry lips forced the words, your fault. And then the girl would bed up, her ones making popping nose as they went back into place from their unnatural positions, and she would walk to her, feet light on the dead grass of fall. Priya would be frozen in shock, her own jaw working overtime to form the words that she wanted to say. I knew you were real. I was the only one looking for you, I'm the only one that remembers. She would never be able to push them from her brain and out of her mouth. The old and dead hand would cup her face, pale skin, stark against the warm brown of her own. Rotten breath that whips into face as the word, liar, was spoke. It was always whispered and sharp fast as if it rushed out of her drab body. Then her small hands would wrap around her fragile neck and it would be cleanly snapped. Everything would go dark, all her other senses turned off as her hearing would lag behind to hear the inhumane laughter of a four-year-old with a body that didn't fit the huge voice. A shiver goes down her spine, it let like a vivid memory, but she knew it was made up. Made up of her guilt that she wasn't able to find her. Her hands got a little tighter on the bars of her bike and she felt the sharp pain of her wrist. Her mind seemed to register that she wasn't in her imagination anymore as she was parking her bike on the same place that it was before, leaning uselessly against the side of her house. She lifted her arm to check the watch that wrapped around her uninjured writ that read 2.30 a.m. and she tried to calculate how long she's been out. How long it's been since Donna. She looked at where Donna's bike was parked just a few hours ago, and then, to the pile of rocks she dropped. They sat in the position that she dropped them in, not one of them unturned. Tears formed in her eyes, and she rubbed them aggressively, she knew they were red, and she wasn't sure of the last time she blinked. She tried to resist, but there was a magnet that pulled her head across the street. She looked at the Clyde's house, the lights were on, and the curtains opened. They were fussing over their new baby, they named him Mateo. Mateo Clyde. It was as if Alma had never been. And to them, she never had. 
she had to remind herself of that, it didn't stop her from being bitter about it. When Mrs. Clyde made the move look up as if she sensed something, Priya quickly jumped behind the thick tree. She peeked after a second to see the woman had moved to the living room, going back to fussing over the baby. He was nothing like Alma, he cried a lot. Her husband opened the front door and looked around, left then right before he closed it and went inside to shut the curtains. Priya let out a breath, her chest burned and it reminded her f when she took a puff of the cigarette earlier with Donna. She dug into her pocket and fished out the pack. It was the last thing that she's had left of her, she knew it was selfish, to keep. She should give it to her mother, or the police, which would be more logical, but she needed to be a little selfish, for now. She held it to her chest and she felt her head softly hit the rough bark of the tree. She took a breath of the dry fall air and released it all too quickly. She tucked the back back into her pocket and looked up at the large tree. She clamped her hands onto the dry bark, a feeling that she was once fond of felt like knives, to her chest. She used to associate the tree bark with Donna, sneaking out when they had no business. But now all it brought up is pain and panic. Memories of what once was. Her grip wasn't as tight as usual, but it was enough to get her by the room window that was left slightly ajar. Her wrist ached as it tried to hold up her body weight, but she didn't let up. She slid from the end of the branch onto the cold wood of the windowsill. Her shoes planted onto the plush carpet of her room, it felt like landing on a cloud after five hours of solid ground. She felt boneless for a second, her legs gave out and her wrist tucked to her chest protectively as it throbbed in time with her heartbeat. What followed was the headache, the pulsing rhythm that wouldn't calm. When someone disappears, they never come back. She had learned how long ago. Donna was gone. No matter how she looked at it, there wasn't a chance that she would see her friend again. Never was a funny word, they used it so loosely as children, but the real meaning sank in now. More than it ever had before. Never. Never. Something that had no chance of happening again. Absolutely proven that there should be no hope left. A sob escaped her and through the pain her hand shot up to her mouth to fuel it. She didn't want to wake her parents no matter what, especially now. Once the tears started they didn't stop, her cheeks were wet and warm for the second time tonight and the stray ones that slid into her mouth were salty, filled with despair. Pain shot through her heart, it hurt way more than her wrist, which she figured was sprained. She cried until she couldn't breathe, lungs burning and face tingling. She almost felt choked, as if she were falling into the sweet recess of sleep. 7. Donna's footsteps were soft on the carpet of the video store. She followed behind Priya, but would stop to look at some of the movies that lined the shelves. Jaws, 3. Mountaintop Motel Massacre, Christine, they have some good stuff here. She picked through the horror section, she was a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Priya plucked the case for her hands. As if your mom would ever let you watch any of that. Donna pouted. She doesn't have to know, Priya turned the case around and squinted in the dark light. This is an R-rated movie. Donna shrugged as to say, so what? And she took it back, holding it to the light, to see the way the moonlight bounced off of the plastic case. When we get out of here, we can watch it. When we get out. Priya walked around the store to the shelves labeled comedy and drama, oh yeah, with what money? The employees left, and there's no way your mom would let you rent that. Donna let out a big dramatic sigh and walked to where Priya was standing with the plastic case still in hand. Who said anything about money? Priya almost dropped the case that was in her hand, mouth dropped open in shock, not the real kind but the kind that said, I was expecting this, but not really. She shook her head as she put the tape that was in her hand back in place where it neatly leaned on the shelf. You don't think they would notice a missing R-rated movie? Donna shrugged, but the motion was still stiff as she trucked it in front of the waistband of her jeans and threw her sweater over it. We can get it back before they notice. Priya didn't know if she should be surprised or concerned that Donna really seemed to believe it and not care. Something is very wrong. Still slightly skeptical, they walked to the corner of the store where the music records were kept. Priya started to thumb through them, nothing really catching her eye as she did so. Her heartbeat picked up, shaking her whole behind and it seemed to sound so loud in the quiet of the store. Donna wasn't talking her eyes, glued to the door like she was expecting something any minute. Don's what are you doing? Priya turned to Donna and the girl said nothing. Priya turned around to look at the door and then back to her friend. Chill out, it's like you said. Nobody is going to find us here. Donna nodded stiffly, suddenly the air around her was fuzzy and loud. Everything about her just screamed acceptance, but the same time ready to run. When she saw that Donna hadn't laughed or at least acknowledged what she said she turned back to her. 
I didn't want to say anything because I know how things are sometimes, but you've been acting weird. What's going on? You know you can tell me anything. The girl shook her head eyes, glued to the door. What can be so bad that you can't tell me? Priya was interrupted when the bell above the door, she jumped before squatting down and pulling Donna down by her wrist when she didn't go down immediately. Did one of the employees come back for something? The alarm bells in her head were blaring no, making her ears ache and her eyes water. Maybe they cold waited out long enough that the person would leave without seeing them. She turned to Donna, so was squatting in front of her, with her back to the open and Priya's against the music wall. She expected to see her scared, maybe even a little upset that they got caught, but she was met with the most terrified expression that Priya had ever seen on a person's face, one that would be engraved into her mind for the rest of her life. She knew, somehow she knew how this would be her last day here. After the petrified expression left her face it was replaced with the most genuine smile, it wobbled on place, the corners of her mouth, trying to turn down into the frown that should have been there. She was obviously terrified, but she didn't want to look it. Don't be scared. She whispered, and it, and it seemed to echo in the small store. Priya would have taken comfort in it if not for the teats in her eyes, when she said it. They didn't fall, but they stay frozen in her eyes, as the shaking smile stayed on. It was then that Priya saw a set of legs behind Donna, she didn't look up and Donna didn't turn around, but Priya knew that she could feel it. She closed her eyes, and a sob escaped, the only sob that she allowed to come out. She pushed the others down and quickly got herself together, taking a gulping breath as she looked Priya in the eyes. Her eyes were glassy, almost like she wasn't fully there. Don't look, okay? I don't know what he wants, what he does, but no matter what, turn around and don't look. Her voice shook, almost as much as her body, breaths choppy, but she didn't turn around. From all Priya could see the man behind her had big brown muddy boots, the kind that would be seen on a fisherman. She was shaking, looking at Donna, with her own tears falling down her face. Don's. Donna what is this? Who is he? Her voice was loud, she didn't care she needed someone to hear, someone to help. Donna shook her head, her smile dropping into an uneasy expression. Pre, turn around. Her voice was still shaking, she was trying to keep it firm, but was quickly failing. I love you Pri. The pure fear that she heard in her voice was enough to make her eyes snap open. That sounded like goodbye, she didn't want it to be goodbye. She took a shaking breath, she had to trust her on this. Her heart hammered and S.H. resisted the urge to look up at the man, to glare at him or start yelling at the top of her lungs for someone to help. This isn't real, this isn't real. It's all a dream. It has to be. She kept repeating it, hoping that she would be able to wake herself up from whatever nightmare this is. Donna gripped her shoulders, Priya, this is real. Turn around. Priya shook her head and turned around, covering her ears and shouldering Donna's hands off. She faced the wall of records, she's been having nightmares since Alma disappeared and this has to be one of them. Another made-up monster, to distract from the fact that the girl is probably dead. I love you too Dons. She spoke to Dream Donna and then waited a second, this is usually when the dream ends. But it didn't. She uncovered her ears and didn't hear anything, not even breathing. Was this some kind of joke? Did Donna do all of this to scare her? Halloween was her favorite holiday and she always tended to start early. But that brings up the question of how she recruited a grown man. With a shaking voice, she speak up, Don's? No answer. She slowly turned around, scared to open her eyes, and see soothing that she didn't want to. She cracked an eye open, the space that Donna once occupied was empty, and the man was gone, all that was left in the spot was the pack of cigarettes. Priya shakily picked it up, it shook so bad in her grip that she almost dropped it. She stood up with the pack to her chest and looked around the store. Don's? Still nothing. Whatever this is, it's not funny. She yelled into the empty space of the store, not bothering to relock the door. She would have to worry about that later, she looked to the bike rack where Donna's mint green bike stood proudly. Donna. The people that were taking a late night walk looked at her like she was insane, their eyes wide, but they didn't stop her. She unlocked her bike with the key that was tucked in her pocket, she jumped on and her legs moved faster than her brain. The wheels of her bike moved faster than ever, and go to a rough area of town where there was nothing but a dirt road and the woods making in a narrow path. She was propelled off of her bike when she tried to stop, running over a rock and throwing her to the ground where she tumbled. She landed on her left arm, her wrist trying to catch her before she fell, and ignored the small sting that steadily made its way up her arm. Donna. She yelled into the woods and jumped back when she heard the bush rustling. A small animal jumped out of it and crushed any dream that she had. 
Terrace were pouring down her face in fact pearls, eyes red and voice strained from screaming Donna's name while biking. She fell to her knees as she shook, limbs moving on their own. She wiped them harder than necessary, what was the next step from here? The police? Maybe they could find that man in two days, before they forgot. Before Donna didn't exist anymore. She knew that it was very unlikely, they never found a missing person. But she knows that this isn't one that she can let go so easily. She gave up on Alma. She gave up on Hannah. She's let too many people down, Donna has been through too much. She can't let her down too. She mounted her bike and stared down the dirt path, flying oats so fast that she could hear the wind whipping her ears. But no matter what, she can't tell them the real story. The one she was conjuring up was already too hard to believe.